Meet John, a financial advisor with over 20 years of experience in the industry. John has seen a lot of changes over the years, but nothing quite like what's happening now. The financial services industry has been changing rapidly to better serve investors, and it's crucial for financial advisors like John to understand and adapt their approach to these changes. Failure to do so will have a profound impact on their success. As John looks back on his career, he realizes that the industry has undergone a complete transformation. The traditional approach of modern portfolio theory and its successors is no longer enough. It's flawed and no longer meets the needs of investors. John knows that he needs to keep up with the latest trends, so he takes a whistle-stop tour of the changes that have taken place in the industry. In this video, John will take you on that journey. You'll learn why there's a place for both passive and active investment management, and about the role of alternative investment strategies. John will also teach you how to establish a goals-based investment portfolio. This approach is perfect for high net worth families who have specific objectives they want to achieve. But that's not all. John will also provide some predictions for the industry's future. He believes that the changes we're seeing now are just the beginning and that there's still a lot more to come. So, buckle up and get ready to learn about the past, present, and possible future of the wealth management industry and how you can be better prepared for it. Remember, this is not financial advice, but rather an analysis of the industry and how you can thrive in it. Chapter 1. In the heart of New York City's financial district, there was a buzz of excitement as a new player entered the wealth management industry. The firm, called Phoenix Wealth Management, was founded by a group of former financial advisors who were determined to disrupt the status quo. Their approach was simple but revolutionary. Instead of relying on human advisors, they would use artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to manage their clients' wealth. They believed that this would not only reduce costs but also provide better returns for their clients. As news of Phoenix Wealth Management spread, it sent shockwaves through the industry. Many financial advisors felt threatened by this new competitor, fearing that they would be replaced by robots and algorithms. Meanwhile, Custodians and asset managers were wary of Phoenix's potential to disrupt their business models. But the founders of Phoenix were undeterred. They knew that their approach was the future of wealth management and they were determined to make it work. They quickly gained a following among tech-savvy investors who were eager to embrace new technologies. As Phoenix continued to grow, the established players in the industry began to take notice. Some tried to compete by developing their own AI-powered solutions, while others dismissed the threat of automation altogether. But the founders of Phoenix were confident that they were onto something big. Then came the pandemic. The financial markets were in chaos, and investors were in a panic. Many traditional advisors struggled to keep up with the changing market conditions, but Phoenix thrived. Their algorithms were able to quickly adapt to the new realities of the market, making rapid adjustments to their clients' portfolios. As the pandemic dragged on, Phoenix emerged as a dominant player in the industry. Their success was due in part to their innovative use of technology, but also to their willingness to embrace change and adapt to new challenges. As the world slowly emerged from the pandemic, the future of the financial services industry remained uncertain. But one thing was clear the key players in the industry would need to continue to evolve and innovate in order to stay ahead of the curve. Chapter 2. Sarah was a young and ambitious investment analyst who had just landed a job at a prominent investment firm. She was excited to put her knowledge of modern portfolio theory to the test, but she quickly learned that the world of investing was much more complex than she had anticipated. Her boss, Mr. Johnson, was an old-school investor who believed in the principles of MPT. He was skeptical of any alternative investment strategies and thought that diversification was the key to success. But Sarah was curious. She had read about the limitations of MPT and was interested in exploring other options. She began to research the alternatives, studying post-MPT and the Black Litterman model, but she found that they too had their drawbacks. It wasn't until she stumbled upon goals-based investing that Sarah felt like she had found a strategy that made sense. She was drawn to the idea of focusing on the investor's goals rather than simply trying to beat the market. 
she believed that this approach would be more appealing to clients who were looking for long-term solutions to their financial needs. But when Sarah proposed this new strategy to Mr. Johnson, he was dismissive. He believed that the only way to achieve success was through MPT, and he was not willing to deviate from his tried and true method. Sarah didn't give up, though. She continued to research and explore different investment strategies, even reaching out to experts in the field for guidance. She also began to look into alternative investments like hedge funds and private markets, as well as sustainable investing. As she delved deeper into these options, Sarah realized that there was no one-size-fits-all solution when it came to investing. Every client had different goals, risk tolerances, and preferences, and it was up to her to find the best strategies to meet their individual needs. Despite Mr. Johnson's reluctance to embrace new ideas, Sarah was determined to prove him wrong. She worked tirelessly to create custom portfolios for each of her clients, incorporating a mix of passive and active management strategies, alternative investments, and sustainable options. Slowly but surely, Sarah began to gain traction. Her clients were impressed with her personalized approach, and she soon became known as one of the most innovative and successful analysts in the firm. In the end, Sarah proved that there was more than one way to achieve financial success. By embracing new ideas and exploring alternative strategies, she was able to help her clients reach their goals and secure their financial futures. And even Mr. Johnson had to admit that there was something to be said for thinking outside the box. Chapter 3. As a financial advisor, Sarah had seen it all, clients buying high and selling low, chasing the latest hot stock, and getting swept up in market hype. It was frustrating to watch clients make irrational decisions based on their emotions, but she knew that it was just human nature. One day, Sarah was meeting with a new client named Tom. Tom had a successful business and had recently sold it for a substantial amount of money. He was eager to start investing and growing his wealth even further. But Sarah could sense that Tom was feeling anxious and uncertain. Tom, let me ask you something, Sarah said. Have you ever made an omelette before? Tom looked surprised. Um, yeah, I have. Why do you ask? Well, building a portfolio is a lot like making an omelette, Sarah explained. Just like an omelette requires the right ingredients in the right quantities, a good investment portfolio requires the right mix of assets. Each asset class is like an ingredient in your omelette. Some people might exclude certain ingredients, just like some investors might exclude certain asset classes from their portfolio. Tom nodded thoughtfully. I see what you mean. So, what should be in my portfolio? Sarah smiled. That depends on your goals and objectives, as well as your risk tolerance. But the important thing is to avoid making emotional decisions based on cognitive biases. We all have biases that can cloud our judgment, but as your advisor, it's my job to keep you on track and remind you of your long-term goals. Tom looked relieved. Thank you for explaining that to me. I feel a lot more confident now. As Sarah and Tom continued their conversation, Sarah realized that explaining complex financial concepts through analogies and stories was a powerful tool for engaging clients and helping them understand behavioral finance. By acknowledging and addressing their cognitive biases, she could guide them towards making more rational decisions and achieving their financial goals. Chapter 4. In the financial world of the 1970s, investing was a game for the wealthy. Only those with the knowledge and connections could hope to make significant returns. But when Burton Malkiel published his book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, he turned the investing world on its head. Malkiel's bold statement, that a blindfolded monkey could select a portfolio just as well as an expert, sparked a heated debate about active versus passive investment management. Malkiel argued that passive investing, like investing in an index fund, was the best option for most investors. At the time, the idea of investing in an index fund seemed crazy. But Malkiel's words proved prophetic. In 1975, Vanguard introduced the first index fund, and it changed the investing world forever. The next big innovation in the investing world came in 1993, with the launch of the first exchange-traded fund, or ETF. ETFs made it easy for investors to access the market cost effectively and tax efficiently. 
They also made it possible for investors to access the S&P 500 in a single trade, without transaction costs and with built-in automatic rebalancing. As ETFs grew in popularity, the range of options available also expanded. ETFs started out as cheap, efficient passive investing options. Now, they offer a range of smart options that use alternative weighting strategies, including factors such as value, size, quantity, volatility, and momentum. In other words, ETFs now offer advisors even greater flexibility when building portfolios for their clients. Despite the rise of passive investing, there is still a place for active management. Many successful fixed income ETFs are actively managed, and there is an active element to each. The question is not whether active or passive investing is better, but how best to use both strategies. Large wealth management firms are currently developing new asset allocation models that use ETFs, mutual funds, and separately managed accounts as building blocks. These models provide benefits to both advisors and investors by aligning the interests of the advisors with those of their clients. However, even with all of these innovations, there is still a need for customization of portfolios to suit the specific requirements of some high net worth and ultra high net worth families. This is where alternative investments come into play. For those in the know, alternative investments can be a lucrative option. But they can also be risky. It takes a skilled advisor to properly weigh the risks and rewards of investing in alternatives. Fortunately, the industry now has a wide range of tools at its disposal to build appropriate portfolios to fully meet most clients' needs. With the right strategy, investors can still see significant returns, even in a world where a blindfolded monkey can seemingly invest just as well as an expert. Chapter 5. In the exclusive world of alternative investments, Rumors have been circulating about a mysterious hedge fund that is shrouded in secrecy. The fund is only available to the ultra-wealthy, with a minimum investment requirement of $10 million. But what makes this fund so special is that it has consistently provided exceptional returns even during the toughest of economic times. Rumors abound about the fund's manager, a reclusive billionaire who has never been seen in public. Some say he is a mathematical genius who uses complex algorithms to predict market movements, while others whisper that he has insider information that gives him an unfair advantage. Despite the rumors, investors are eager to get in on the action. But gaining access to the fund is not easy. Prospective investors must go through a rigorous screening process that includes a thorough background check and an in-person interview with the fund's manager. As the buzz around the fund grows, some investors begin to wonder if it's too good to be true. Could it be a Ponzi scheme or a fraud? But those who have invested in the fund continue to reap the rewards, with returns that far outpace traditional investments. Meanwhile, a group of socially responsible investors has been quietly working behind the scenes to investigate the fund's practices. They are concerned about the fund's lack of transparency and its possible involvement in unethical business practices. As the investigation heats up, tensions rise between the two groups of investors. One group is focused solely on profits, while the other is committed to doing good in the world. But when the truth about the hedge fund is finally revealed, it will send shockwaves through the world of alternative investments and force investors to question what really matters when it comes to their investments. Chapter 6. As a financial advisor, Jane had worked with many high net worth families, but the Smiths were different. They were mysterious and guarded, revealing very little about themselves. But Jane was determined to help them achieve their financial goals. The Smiths had come to her with a request for a goals-based investment approach. Jane was pleased to hear that, as it meant they had a clear idea of what they wanted to achieve. However, as she began to work with them, she realized that the Smiths' needs were more complex than she had initially thought. The first step was discovery but the Smiths were reluctant to share much about themselves. They didn't have a mission statement, and when asked about their goals and objectives, they were evasive. Jane knew that without a clear understanding of their needs, she wouldn't be able to develop a successful investment strategy. Jane pressed on, analyzing the Smiths' estate and trust issues. She discovered that they had multiple trusts, but they were vague about how assets were to be distributed. As she delved deeper, 
Jane realized that the Smiths were more concerned with secrecy than with achieving their goals. Despite these challenges, Jane persevered, developing asset allocations based on the limited information she had. She selected the best investments possible, considering ETFs, SMAs, registered funds, and private funds. She incorporated both active and passive strategies and even included some alternative investments to diversify the portfolio. As she monitored progress toward goals, Jane became increasingly frustrated. The Smiths were unresponsive, and she had no way of knowing if the portfolio was meeting their needs. Then one day, everything changed. Jane received a call from Mr. Smith, who requested an urgent meeting. When she arrived at their estate, she was surprised to find the entire family assembled. They handed her a piece of paper, their mission statement. As Jane read the statement, she finally understood the Smiths' needs. They were not concerned with making more money, instead, they wanted to use their wealth to make a positive impact on the world. They had specific goals in mind, such as funding research for rare diseases and supporting sustainable farming practices. With this new understanding, Jane was able to revise the Smiths' investment strategy. She focused on socially responsible investments and made sure that their portfolio aligned with their mission statement. The Smiths were pleased with the changes, and Jane felt a sense of satisfaction that she had helped them achieve their goals. In the end, Jane learned an important lesson. Managing a family's finances is not just about investments and returns. It's about understanding their unique needs and goals and developing a strategy that aligns with their values. By doing so, she was able to create a portfolio that not only provided financial security but also made a positive impact on the world. Chapter 7. As the sun set on the city skyline, Jessica sat in her downtown office, scrolling through the latest industry reports. The last 10 years had been a whirlwind of change, but she knew that even greater transformations were on the horizon. With a deep breath, she closed her laptop and leaned back in her chair, thinking about the predictions for the next decade. She knew that Davido was right, the demographics of investors were already changing. Younger, more diverse clients were seeking financial advice and guidance, and they had different goals and priorities than their parents and grandparents. Jessica knew that she would need to adjust her approach to better serve this new generation of investors. But it wasn't just the clients that were changing, the industry itself was evolving. Commissions were falling, and trading was becoming commission-free. This meant that wealth advisors would need to find new ways to generate revenue, such as using affiliated products in model portfolios and forming revenue-sharing relationships with asset managers. Jessica knew that this would require her to be more creative and innovative in how she managed her clients' portfolios. And then there was artificial intelligence. Jessica had always been skeptical of the hype surrounding AI, but she knew that it was becoming more sophisticated and nuanced. It could learn more about client needs and behavior, anticipate their needs, and help advisors choose the best strategies for their clients. But she also knew that AI would never be able to replace the empathy and personal touch that a good wealth advisor could provide. Jessica knew that these changes would require her to adapt and evolve her value proposition as a wealth advisor. She would need to continually educate herself and her clients, find new ways to generate revenue, and incorporate AI in a way that complemented her skills as an advisor. As she turned off the lights in her office and headed home, Jessica couldn't help but feel excited about the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. The next decade would be a time of great change in the industry, but she was ready to navigate those changes and continue to provide her clients with the best possible advice and guidance. Now, the insights and knowledge I gained from reading Goals-Based Investing were phenomenal. I highly recommend it. Thank you for taking the time to watch, and if you found value in this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more great content. Trust me, you won't regret it.